So, uh, Rick, come on up and tell us what it's like to talk to these guys about Jesus. <laughs> well, I don't think a hockey chaplain's going to stop any of that. That's for sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those were some uh, interesting clips there. I've seen um, a lot of the players that I've worked with. I hope they didn't bring back any. I got Eric Lind here. He's a coach of the Connecticut Oilers. I hope they didn't bring back any. Uh, Stir any emotions up there, you know, about your playing days. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a journey. Looking through that, it's pretty cool to see a lot. Like I said, a lot of the players that I've worked with, and I didn't know that there were that many clips. Um, I have a short clip here to show you what about the ministry is about, and then um, I can talk to you about what I do and how I got there and my story. After I uh, encountered Christ as a junior hockey player, I had a deep desire to share uh, the message of, of hope that I discovered in Jesus Christ with hockey players, especially my teammates. After I retired um, from hockey, uh, I continued to stay in touch with different players that I had played with. and. Finally, in 1977, um, the burden just sort of grew and grew and grew and the vision and just felt the Lord calling me to have a full-time uh, ministry and outreach to the hockey community. There are many people that think that you really can't be a Christian and a, and a hockey player, that they don't fit. But we have come to discover in hockey ministries that you can be a dedicated Christian and a dedicated hockey player at the same time. It's really a beautiful merge of hockey and, and the Bible and God. In the world of hockey, you don't always have that mix and you don't have that opportunity. When Jesus was going to leave the earth and he, he talked to his disciples, he said, uh, go into Jerusalem and uh, make disciples. Teach them, baptize them, you know, bring them along behind you. We at Hockey Ministries, we actually believe that. That's what we're called to do. We're, the hockey world's a big world. We know hockey, we played hockey, and we can go and we can talk to people. Well, HMI's had a huge role in my life. Um, I grew up in a great Christian family, um, but growing up it was always like my parents' religion. Um, so once I got out into college, I needed to find my own faith, and HMI was a huge role in that. We're telling the hockey world how they can know Christ personally and how they, they can be assured that they're going to heaven when they die. Communicating the gospel in the hockey world is at the core of who Hockey Ministries is and we do that through our summer hockey programs in 30 plus uh, centers in six countries. We have nearly 2,000 young boys and girls that come through our program every year. Through clinics throughout the wintertime across uh, North America and then again through our chapel programs and we have over 250 chapel programs in uh, 35 different leagues. And then on, on top of that we have our, uh, our publications like our, our uh, testimony books and our, our Hockey Players New Testaments, our publications that we put out to put the Word of God in people's hands. It's a vast ministry and it's run by, mostly by volunteers. We need a team of people praying and encouraging and actually sending us to the hockey world. We're bringing that message of hope and good news to these young men. Yes, we want you to be successful, to pursue your dreams. This is how God made you. He gave you these gifts and talents and you need to make the best of them. Uh, but what's your motivation in your heart? I'm obviously passionate about hockey and I'm passionate about the Lord. So when you bring two things together like that, there's nothing better. HMI is a place where we can um, bring God at the forefront um, and still pursue our passion of, of being 
hockey um, coaches or players or whatever it may be, um, but really do it for the glory of God. It's all been God putting it together, bringing the right people, the right resources, and it's just, it's a God thing. That's a little bit about where we're about, what we do um, with hockey ministries, where we work with hockey players and throughout every single league. But I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I got saved in 1987 at Billy Graham Crusade in, in Hartford, uh, the Civic Center. Now is the XL Center. Um, and it was, uh, this is my 20th year doing hockey ministries. Uh, last 11 years, I've been a volunteer chaplain doing Hartford and then started with New York and overseeing some of the teams in the American League. Uh, past nine years, I've been full-time ministry, and um, it's an interesting story on how that came about. Uh, first of all, I'll share about my responsibilities with the ministry. Uh, we have, basically, you heard on the video here, our ministry is broken up two se separate sections. It's, we got our camps and our chapel programs, which right now we're in our chapel program season, which is winding down, and we're starting to prepare for our camps. But uh, for our chapel program, uh, the American Hockey League is my main responsibility, so I oversee the whole American Hockey League for the chapel program. And basically, if you don't know what chapel is, basically a chapel is just a Bible study, a small talk, which lasts maybe 15, 20 minutes with the players uh, once a week. And um, so every single team in the American Hockey League, which there are 30 teams, and the American Hockey League feeds the NHL with players. A player gets out of juniors or college, and they get drafted, and they go to the American League sometimes for a period of time learn their skills a little bit better, uh, their game is, is faster, and, and then they go up to the NHL if they're lucky to make it. So every single team in the American Hockey League has a chaplain that's available for the players. So when a player leaves their junior team or college, if they have chapel program in those areas, they go to the American League, there's a chapel program there, and hopefully when they get to the NHL, there's a chapel program over there too. We have a I think 23 or 24 of the National Hockey League teams covered with a chaplain also. So wherever these players go, there is something for them. There is a chapel program. There's something there for them. And it's the same organization, Hockey Ministry, so they know what they're getting when they get there. My responsibility is for the 30 chaplains to oversee those 30 chaplains and encourage them uh, to build them up, to train them, to, to reach the players, how to reach them. I organize... Uh, team um, presentations to, in the beginning of the season. I organize them to meet the coach uh, in the beginning of the season to get a key player that is going to be their lead guy uh, for the season. I organize all that. We work one-on-one -on -one with players and coaches uh, to meet their needs, meet their spiritual needs right where they're at. And also I work with NHL chaplains to uh, when a player gets moved up or sent down, which could be a very stressful time for players when they go, the AHL is a very, very key organization because you have players going up to the NHL from the AHL, which they're really happy when they get moved up. Anytime you get a raise, you always get excited. And then, but when you get sent down from the NHL, there's always that level of stress and like, wow, I, I wasn't good enough or I didn't make it or what's going on, what did I do wrong? So the AHL, the American Hockey League, is a very um, key league where players are going up and down. We've uh, passed, in the past year or so, we've set up chapels in the NHL with the Bruins and the Islanders and the New Jersey Devils. And my, myself, as Paul was saying, I do uh, chapel with the Hartford team in the American League. I do chapel with the Rangers and Quinnipiac and UConn. And we started uh, this year with Yale. We do Yale also. And I started all this also this year with the Connecticut Oilers um, and the EHL, right? EHL. Uh, which has been a great, great time working with the younger kids. It's, it's really awesome. I, I really um, get excited about that, and it's like to see their, their reaction and get their input. Our other part of our ministry is our hockey camps, which you saw in that video. We, we do over 33 hockey camps, uh, week-long hockey camps during the summertime. So that's a lot of camps packed into like maybe eight weeks in the summertime. Sometimes we have four and five camps going on at the same time. And all of our, most of our staff that do camps are all volunteers that come out. And our camps range from anywhere from 40 to 50 
campers up to 125 campers. Our St. Louis and Chicago camps are our biggest camps. Pittsburgh, we get over about 125 campers coming out those camps. Our camps are from ages 9 to 17 years old. Uh, my responsibility in camps, uh, I'm a, a counselor at St. Louis and Chicago camps, and that means having uh, 10 to 12 campers anywhere from ages 10 to 17 years old for a whole week. I'm their dad for the whole week and overseer. So um, it's a great time. Uh, the skill, the level between ages between 16 and 17, the 10 year olds, is, it's a real challenge. So um, I try to find out before I get there what I have so I can mentally prepare what I'm going to do if I have to tie their skates or uh, really straighten them out if they're 15 or 16. Because at that, you know, everyone knows at 15, 16, 17 years old, you know everything. You know everything about the world, you know everything, how to do everything. So um, it's, it's a great time. And also, I'm a camp count, uh, overseer of the uh, director, camp director of a, our camp in Los Angeles. We started that five years ago. Don't ask me how a guy from the East Coast got to be a camp director on a, of a camp from the West Coast, because I, I cannot answer that question. But I love going out to uh, Los Angeles for a week. Totally different uh, atmosphere for hockey. And uh, we're starting a brand new camp in Keene, New Hampshire this year, so um, this summer. So I'm, I'm overseeing that uh, camp also. As you heard Lori Boschman, our staff member, said we have over 2,000 kids coming to our camp every year. So when you think about it, that's 2,000 kids being exposed to the gospel every year. That's a lot. And um, it's a great, great time. And we prepare the campers for challenges of life that they're going to face. And we give them the message of hope from Christ. And I, I feel that our camps are our biggest, um, biggest part of our ministry. Uh, once we get to the AHL and, and the pro levels, we're just ministering to these players, and, and there are issues they go through, but for our camp, our camp level, it's where we're really reaching young, young people, uh, ages 10 to 17 years old. Uh, one of the interesting things that I found out when I did a couple of chapel presentations to teams, how we opened up the whole team to, to the team, opened up to the whole team of our chapel program, uh, about three or four years ago, I did two or three of them here in the East Coast, and um, I had players come up to me and said, you know what, I know about your ministry because I attended the camps when I was younger. And so I, here is these kids when they were younger, 10, 12, 13 years old, they attended our camps and now they're playing in the pro level. And when I heard that, it may really makes you feel like, wow, it's all coming full circle. It's, it is working and these kids are really making it. So I can explain to you how did I get there. You're probably thinking, like, how, how do you get involved? How did I get there? Well, it was a journey. Like I said, I got saved in 87, uh, Billy Graham crusade. I just knew there was more. I just knew there was more that I could give to, to what God has given me, the gift. Um, so before I started doing ministry work, I was, uh, I was a milkman. I was a milkman for like 10 years. And um, before that, I worked in, uh, for delivering soda. So my body was taking a beating. So back in 2006, um, I had back surgery, and uh, I didn't know how bad it was going to be. Um, you hear horror stories about back surgery, and I was blessed to, to really come out of it really well. I had a good surgeon. But little did I know that I was going to be out of work for almost probably about a year. And um, my doctor knew exactly what he was doing because I wanted to go back to work, and he's like, you can't go back to work, you can't go back to work. And I'm like, yeah, I, I feel good, but no, you gotta wait, you gotta wait. So when you have those times at home and you're alone, you do a lot of wrestling with God. I understood the whole story about Job wrestling with God. And, and you really, really have some good discussions with him when you're home alone. Like, God, what, what is the next step? Like, what am I gonna do? Um, how am I gonna provide for my family? I have three, three children. Um, how am I going to do that? You know, how, you know, how can God use me? So you go through those things, and all of a sudden you find out that your job doesn't have to take you back after you were out on, on medical leave for a while. And now it's even, it's even more stressful. Like, wow, now what do I do? Like, do I start looking for another job? Do I find something else? So you go to God in prayer with that, and then you say, like, okay, God, you got to lead me. What's the next step? And so all I kept on hearing was, like, keep doing what you're doing keep doing what you're doing. I was a volunteer chaplain already for, for nine years. And so I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to trust God and go out on a limb, and I'm going to do hockey ministries full time. 
And little did I know when I was praying about that and thinking about it, that our office in Montreal was praying for a person uh, for about six months to uh, come on staff in the Northeast because hockey here is so big in the area, in the Northeast. Um, and they were praying for like six months that we would get a full-time staff member to come on board. And I never knew that until I went up to the office and said, you know, I, I'm really praying about coming on full-time. But you think about that, like, you go, things go through your mind like, okay, God, how can you use me? What am, what am I going to do? Like, this is like, I'm speaking with professional athletes, you know, it's like, well, that, that's a, that's a big challenge, you know, like, I don't really, I was never a professional athlete, I don't know. I tried to play hockey when I was younger. I tried to play golf when I was younger. You know, you try these things, but you don't know how God's going to use you. And then Satan comes in and puts that fear in your, in your life, like, you know, attacks you like, oh, man, what if I fail? What if I can't do this? What if I, you know, I, I'm a missionary. What if I can't get enough support for myself? What, you know, what if, like, these guys laugh at me? Like, and what if I'm not, like, studied up, you know? All these things come into your mind uh, a failure, and that's, and that's just the devil attacking you. We know in Hebrews 13, 5, it says that he will never leave you and never, never forsake you. So you know that you got that backing behind you, that he's going to be there for you, that God's going to be there. And even if you do fall down, you get back up again. He's, got, he's right there picking you up. He's got you by, right in, your, in his hands, and he'll get you right back up again. So... And I thought, like, okay, how, what can I, how can I minister to these guys? How, how can I be used in situations that God's going to put us in? But we find out that God will use us in any situation that we're in if we're following him. You know, he's going to lead us in every, in every way. So you think, like, wow, okay, you're going to do this. And, you know, like, I have faith. You know, I mean, we all say, like, you know, once we follow God, you know, we have some faith, right? But then when you have to go out on ministry, that's when really faith comes in. That's when you think like, okay, I'm not getting a paycheck every week from my boss. I'm not going to work every day. I'm going to work every day, but I don't have to get up and go out to go to work and report to somebody. I just got to report to one person, and he's a good boss, that's for sure. Um, where am I going to get my health insurance from? Like, like what? this is not Canada. We don't have like health, like right, health insurance like right there. Where am I gonna, where's that going to come from? How am I going to provide? You know, um, but that you think you have faith. I thought I had faith when I first accepted Christ into my life. But then you go out to full time ministry and it's like, whoa, I had like just a little bit of faith. I didn't have enough faith that I thought I would. And that's when that faith thing really kicks in. You say like, wow, I really got to have faith. I really got to trust him now because I am putting my life into his hands. And that's, you know, where the faith thing really comes in. So. Max Lucado says, faith is not the belief that God will do what you want. Faith is the belief that God will do what is right. You know, a complete trust in him. A complete trust in him. And now I think that was the hardest thing for me, like going into full-time ministry, was like to really put my faith in him, to put my whole life into his hands and say, God, you got this. You got this. This is yours. And I'm going to follow you, what you're leading. And he's provided. He's provided. Um, all these years. I was talking to Brent over here and we were talking about like at the end of the year when you look at your final statement and you're like, that, that's what I took in, but this is what I did. How, how can that be? <laughs> it doesn't work out. I'm sure we've all done that before. Like, wow, this doesn't equal out, but it does. I don't know how, you know, it's God. We, you know, it just works. Um, and also when you go in this journey of ministry, like you don't know where God's going to lead it to. You know, you don't know um, what he's going to do, how he's going to use you, how he's going to work. And um, when I first started out in ministry, I was like overseeing half of the American League and then with another staff member. Uh, and, and by the way, we only have 20, 26 full-time staff members of hockey ministry, and we do all our camps and our chapel programs, like, like you heard, mainly with volunteers. So first, like I said, I was overseeing half of the American League, and then you... That person left the ministry, went to be a pastor of a church, and then you say, okay, what well, you're going to do the whole American Hockey League, and then now can you do this team and that team, and then you can do this team, and you can do this, and you run this camp, and things just keep going and going. And um, 
So you don't know how God's going to use you, but you trust him. You trust him and watch him work. And that is the amazing thing that I've seen through this ministry, that you just watch God work. And some of the things that we say in the hockey ministries, because when you go to the rink to do a chapel program, you don't know who's going to show up. It could be one guy. It could be ten guys. But what we say in the ministry is all you got to do is show up. And isn't that what everything in life of ministry, just show up and watch God work, and he will do amazing things. I had one chaplain in, in, in one of the teams that I oversaw. He would go to the rank, and nobody would come to chapel. And he would sit there for like almost an hour every, day, every once a week, and he would just pray for the players. He would just pray. He did that for like, I think, two to three years he did that. Nobody would come out to chapel. Nobody was interested. Uh, he couldn't reach anybody. And he would just stand in the, in the stands and just pray for players for like over an hour. I thought that was amazing. So the impact we can have on, on, on the hockey world, um, we saw, you saw your testimony. I have tons of testimonies of, of players. But we all want to have impact, right? I mean, in our Christian walk, we all want to have impact. And sometimes you say, like, how can we have impact? How can we impact people? And you say, like, just show up. Just show up. Um, and, I, and I look at the campers and the camps that we do, and I think, like, man, this is the biggest impact we can have on these young kids because you don't know where these kids are coming from. You don't know where these campers, when they come to camp, they just want to get away from home maybe for a week and just be with somebody. And some of the stories you hear from some of these kids, their home lives are not very good. We just heard a story um, last year in, a, in our Los Angeles camp on Thursday night, we uh, usually give the campers an opportunity to share what the camp has done in their life for the week. So usually somebody will get up there and they say, I want to thank my grandmother for let, making me come to the camp. And you, they go through the story. Sometimes we have to shut some of these kids off. But this one young person came up there and he was about 16 years old and it just totally blows away. Like the whole room was like in shock after he came up there. He told us that he is, um, his parents were very heavily involved in drugs, and um, they made him do drug runs at like 10 and 12 years old. And he was running drugs for, this, for his family. Um, then his mom got, or I think his dad was in jail, got put in jail, and his mom was not a, a fit mom for his like three, two other siblings. Um, and he was living in his car for almost six months. He was living in his car for six months <clears throat> with his two younger siblings, and he was, like, kind of nurturing them, sending them to school. <clears throat> and it really blew us away because we never expected that, never expected to hear that. And the church took him in and found the family that they could all live with, and they kind of, like, brought this family along. His mom and dad are not in the picture anymore, but he's uh, the oldest one of the, th of the three, and he was just... Uh, had to be the mom and dad figure for, the, for his younger siblings. And uh, he was got back, come to camp, and loves hockey. Uh, this is a person, this is a young man out in L.A. And uh, it was an amazing thing to hear that. It kind of opened all of our eyes to say, like, wow, wow, this is like we don't know where these young kids are coming from. And it's so true because we never know where they're coming from. So making an impact, preaching the word, and it could be overwhelming sometimes, and we just don't know what we're going to reach and what we're going to do and how we're going to reach young people with the gospel. But um, I'm just that thankful that God has put me in this position to minister to, you, to sports, uh, sports, player, uh, sports people. And we minister to coaches, players, fans, front office people. We're just there. We're available for teams and available for all the players at all times. And I just want to thank you very much for, for this morning. It was awesome. Great to be here. I appreciate your time.